So we'll um, we'll start with the Heart Sutra. You guys have the Heart Sutra in the back of your green book. Okay, so we'll we'll set our motivation. And uh, if you want to, you can recite along. Otherwise, just really listen and sit with the meaning. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagawan was dwelling on Mass of Vultures Mountain in Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasat Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the venerable Sharivadi Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic. Unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. No visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayata, Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisoha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagawan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara saying, well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated, even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagawan having thus spoken, the venerable Sharivadiputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, asuras, and gandavas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagawan. Last time um, on the Wednesday, I was um, explaining about the difference between 
um, conventional wrong consciousness and, you know, looking at what is real and what is unreal as an example for seeing that we already understand that there's a difference between appearance and existence, even conventionally, right? And so we talked about, you know, really common examples that are given in Buddhism all the time. So the example of a mirage really looks like there's water, even though there's no water. A white shell or a white conch really looks yellow if you have jaundice. Um, if you look in the mirror, it looks like there's another face in the mirror. If you see the, the moon reflected on water, it really seems like there are two moons. And in all of those cases, we see something different than reality, but we don't believe it, right? So it's an easy example, but it's to help us understand that in terms of grasping at inherent existence, it's a similar issue where things appear in one way and they exist in the exact opposite. So if you're just to think, how do things appear as opposed to how are things exactly? What's the disparity? Things appear what? And they are what? They appear Mika said that they appear inherently existent. Perfect. They appear inherently existent. And the opposite is true, right? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. So the way that things appear is X is completely opposite to the way things are. And we use those examples of real and unreal conventionally as an example for that. And, you know, we have to look at this at many different levels, but the first thing we look at is kind of the power of opinion. If you look at how very powerful appearances become in dependence on how strong your opinion is. So if you're very certain that someone is a difficult person, you've labeled them a difficult person, then their appearance, you know, not just the way they look visually, but their kind of impression on your mind, you have an immediate negative impression and immediately old karmic seeds from the past, negative karmic seeds are ripened and you have an unpleasant experience. So you might feel, you know, tight and kind of agitated, or you might feel like you need to get away from them, or you might feel like you need to explain something to them forcefully, but there's kind of a, a tightness in the body and an agitation in the mind, purely through the strength of your opinion. But because the appearance is so much that they are a difficult person, we don't take a minute to kind of unpack that. We adhere to it. We believe in it 100%, just like, you know, a small child or an animal would see a face in the mirror and think that there's a whole other creature there or that themselves have split in two or, you know, they'd have some sort of misunderstanding because things look one way, they believe it. So for us every day, all day, things look a certain way and we believe it 100% without even a tiny bit of space to consider, this is my projection. So the surface projection is just like in the realm of opinions. And fortunately, we have some experience of opinions changing. And when our opinions change, the appearance changes. Have you ever had this happen with like a stranger, for example, who, at first, you don't think of anything in particular about maybe their face? And then you grow to really love them and really appreciate them. And then their same exact face seems beautiful to you. You know, nothing has changed about their face. They haven't gained or lose weight. They haven't, like nothing has changed. It's their same face, but now it's a beautiful face because you love them. And if that love was mixed with attachment and the attachment starts to build and the love starts to go, that's still an attractive face to you, an appealing face to you, but as soon as attachment doesn't get what it wants, then the face is less appealing. Now just the sight of them makes you a little uncomfortable, 
maybe full of neediness or sadness or melancholy, longing, you know, all sorts of different things come up and it's still just the same face. So in the beginning, it was a face you were just like indifferent to, it's just a person. Then it became beautiful. Then it became ugly or, you know, something that you had a lot of complex emotions about. So that's still very surface, right? That's still in the realms of kind of even basic psychology, not even psychoanalysis, right? This is just ordinary everyday projection. And here that the Buddhist teachings are going deeper than that, but use that as your starting point because it's already comfortable, right? So you're just thinking about the fact that my opinion reinforces or gives me appearances, yeah? appearances. And then you take a step further and you think, okay, what distinguishes me from them? Yeah, what is what you know, what is the appearance of duality between two people? And at first, it can be very, you know, kind of rational and logical. And you just think, well, physically, there are two different bodies, no problem. Yeah, and those two different bodies are disconnected and unrelated and not a part of one another. And that feels very true because in one sense, it is. And then as soon as you do any kind of analysis, you realize you're sharing air and there's skin cells flying everywhere and water droplets flying everywhere. And that's why, you know, pandemics happen, right? If we were completely distinct bodies in little bubbles, we wouldn't have any influence on each other's bodies. But, you know, if we hit each other, if we hug each other, if we breathe near each other, there is a different experience in your physicality because of the people around you. There's a different temperature. And so then you start to have like a blurring of lines where, where you start and end is kind of blurring into where they start and end. And you start to feel like, even though I can mentally draw a boundary between me and you because there are two different bodies, actually those bodies are not fundamentally separate. They're not fundamentally separate, are they? Right? And then you even look biologically and see the way that, you know, the environment is completely interdependent. And when one thing happens in one part of the environment, it has a ripple effect on other parts of the environment and so on. So physically, we know this, but in everyday life, we're not challenging appearances. And we can get away with not challenging appearances and still have an okay life. But if we were to challenge appearances more kind of intentionally, then we would have a lot more space in the mind for things to shift and be flexible. So then you move to the distinction between self and other in terms of the mind. And you feel very much like you're in control and in complete ownership of your own mind or completely a victim of circumstance and everything is happening to you and your mood is completely related to people and the environment and you're not in charge at all. So we kind of go back and forth between I am in control of my mind and I am the only thing in control of my mind to I'm not in control at all and I can't help it if I feel this way. I can't help my mood. I can't help it. It's something else's fault. Generally speaking, we kind of go back and forth between those two illusions when it's much more both, isn't it? You're in control-ish and other things have an influence-ish, <laughs> right? A little bit, right? Both sides. And the appearance is very much more concrete than what the reality is. So why does it even matter? Yeah, why does this even matter? The fact that there is this hard distinction, this duality between self and other that feels so apparent and true to us, despite the fact the opposite is the case, because it becomes the root of samsara, or it's from the root of samsara, or it perpetuates the root of samsara. So what is the root of samsara? <laughs> And you can use any of the phrasings um, or any um, mishmash of phrasings, but generally speaking, what would you say 
is the root of samsara, what started cyclic existence or what perpetuates cyclic existence? What kind of ignorance? True, ignorance, true. What kind? The emptiness of the interconnection. The wind going in, interbeing, and emptiness. It's going in the right direction, but not quite. What, what are we ignorant of? What specifically are we ignorant of that's the biggest problem? The self. The self, yeah. The self. And what does ignorance think is true about the self? Maybe believing the labeling? It's going that way, yeah, more? Inherent existence? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So ignorance thinks the self is inherently existent. Right. So this is where we get a subtle distinction. There's the appearance of inherent existence, and then there's the belief in inherent existence. And this is a very important distinction because the appearance is actually not as problematic as the belief. Because again, we could see our face in the mirror. It really looks that way, but we don't believe it. We have the ability to see something different than reality and understand the distinction and understand the difference. But the problem is, is that with the self is that we are certain of the appearance being the reality. So you say ignorance believes that the self is inherently existent. What is an inherently existent self? What's the mistake? You know, so, so you go to this other level of what is the problem precisely and experientially, what would it mean if the self were inherently existent? We know that it's not, we know that it's empty of inherent existence, but if it were inherently existent, what would be true about it? What does inherence mean anyway? What's the illusion? it's not uh, dependent on parts yep um, yeah not dependent on parts kind of goat yeah it would be it would be permanent that's one piece yep and uh, if it's permanent, then it can't rely on causes and conditions. Um, the next level, parts. The next level, it wouldn't need to be merely labeled by the mind. And that's the subtlest. So if the self were inherently existent, there would be no need to label. There would be no need to label because it would be obvious already. You would be born and your parents would magically know your name and you would magically know your name. It would just be a self-evident name. And everyone who met you as a baby would know your name before your parents explained, right? And not only that, the self of you as well, right? There would be no name for naming person. It would be obvious. Right. So, so to see that inherent existence is impossible is really important. Inherent existence is impossible. Why is it impossible? It contradicts logic and it contradicts the deep experience of meditators. So we start with the way it contradicts logic and that helps us engage with it in meditation. So we actually experience the truth of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that Rona back there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I, um, I really walked around with this flat meditation and, and and it helped me. But then I I wanted to ask you because I think you want to talk about it and I forgot how you um, presented it. 
that we, we still have, a, we do have an, a sense of continuity, even though we are not the same person or phenomena from moment to moment, but we do have this uh, feeling or we have this sense of continuity. So, uh, what, what is the source? Is this uh, the labeling? Is the source? Believing the, the labeling of, of ourselves is the source of continuity? Or is it something else? It's it's the valid basis. Okay. The valid basis. And that an understanding about a valid basis is, is what prevents you from nihilism and also what prevents you from being completely absurd. You know, like I can't label I can't label one person's name on someone else. I can't say that the cat is an elephant. You know, there has to be a valid basis there which is why we're not complete nihilists, right? We go right to the edge and then take a step back. So a valid basis is why we can continuously label the same label on the same basis, even though the basis is changing moment to moment. You know, really always come back to that analogy of a river because it will help you not be confused. The, the river can have the same name every second, every day, every year, but still the river is changing moment to moment to moment, isn't it? Right? The bank is changing, the bottom is changing, the water is changing, the river is in constant movement, but the nature of the river is still water, right? Just like the nature of the mind is still clarity and awareness. Yeah. Together in the river is... Um, kind of the potential for absolute purity and development into the ocean. The mind always has the potential to become fully enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. The river has mud, has silt, has debris, has leaves, has pollution, but they don't enter into the water molecules themselves. The water carries along those obscurations, those things that make it muddy and not clear, but those things that make it muddy and not clear are not the river. Just like the mind has ignorance and has had ignorance from beginningless time, but that ignorance does not become a main mind. It's just a mental factor that's carried along and can be removed. Yeah. So the river analogy is very useful in understanding the mind or understanding even the person. But, you know, keep remembering that a valid basis is essential for labeling. What makes a valid basis a valid basis? We'll talk about in a, maybe in a few weeks, but basically, you know, and we've mentioned it before, a valid basis has to be in alignment with worldly convention in alignment with worldly convention, which is not to say in alignment with worldly opinion, you know? So worldly convention would say, this is a cup because it holds liquid. Worldly opinion would say it's a good cup or a bad cup, right? So a valid basis isn't if it's good or bad, it's that it is a cup because it fulfills the function of a cup but it's still not a cup from its own side, right? In and of itself. And it didn't make itself. And I didn't know it was a cup when I was a baby, right? It wasn't a self-existent cup. I could have worn it as a hat, right? <laughs> right, when you're a baby. But um, if it was inherently existent, then there would be no need to name it. Yeah, yeah, Talia? The potential. Is it inherently existent, or it's also um, in, in nature, but it's all unchanging? Yeah, exactly. It's in you know there is nothing that is inherently existent, but there are some things that are permanent. So permanent and inherent existence are not synonyms, but in the beginning they sound as if they are. And the first level of realizing the way things don't exist the way they appear is unpacking our grasping at permanence. So Buddha nature is empty of inherent existence, 
but three parts of the Buddha body are completely impermanent, change moment to moment. And then that last piece, the naturally abiding lineage is permanent. Why is it permanent? Because it doesn't change moment to moment. What is it? It's the emptiness of the mind. So emptiness itself is a permanent phenomena. Yeah, emptiness doesn't change moment to moment. But the basis that we label emptiness onto does. Does it make sense? No. Excellent. Yes, some, yes, some, no. <laughs> some, yes, no. Or maybe it half makes sense. Maybe half makes sense. Okay. So to say, I guess to say that things are empty means that they are continually lacking a characteristic. And they always lack that characteristic the whole time they're alive, right? So you have your book and you know that scientifically it's disintegrating moment to moment. So even though it looks like it's the same as yesterday, you know that gradually the paper is going and gradually the cover is going. And in 300 years, if I left it out in the open in humidity, it would be dust. And it wouldn't suddenly become dust it gradually becomes dust. But the whole time it's alive or the whole time it's a book, it is empty. And the fact of its emptiness doesn't change. But the basis that we label emptiness onto does. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting point because, you know, grasping at permanence is also part of the problem, you know, even though it's coarse, it's still part of the problem and it's why we don't believe we're going to die. Yeah, we, we know that we're going to die, but we don't believe that we're going to die. If we believed that we were going to die, we would live differently. Yeah, and if we believed the hard facts <laughs> of the truth of death, then we would realize death could come at any time when we're young or when we're old, when we're healthy, when we're sick, any time. But because we have grasping at permanence, we don't really believe we're going to die. So that's problematic, <laughs> right? That leads to all sorts of ways in which we waste time. But that's just surface, isn't it? Then you go down to parts, which really is the discussion of identity. And that's why it's really interesting to look at identity from the conventional perspective that you all look at in psychology, conditioning, history, you know, all kind of societal influences, all of that stuff is related to parts and context. But even more subtle is what are the parts that we label the parts that we label the parts that we label the parts and you realize there is no fundamental building block of self. No fundamental building block, no core essence, no soul, no Atman. But there is self continuously labeled onto the mind. It's just that that mind doesn't have a core, right? It's like a banana tree, right? You just keep peeling and peeling and peeling. There's no core there, but still there's a banana tree. Yeah. So momentary parts of consciousness are what we're labeling self onto as well as labeling onto the body. But the body very obviously depends upon parts, very obviously depends upon context. That's, pr that's pretty easy, right? That you can't, yeah. But the mind is more subtle. So you really sit with, all right, what is the mind? What is the mind or what is the self that feels like it's mind? And if you watch your own mind for a second, at first, usually it's whatever is the dominant mental experience feels like self. So it doesn't even matter which part of your mental experience it is, just kind of find what feels dominant. Is it how you're feeling? Is it how you're describing? Is it what you're moving towards or away from? Or was it, is it what you're focused on? And you kind of cycle through like the levels of dependency meditation at the end. We looked at the five omnipresent mental factors because those five are always there. They kind of take turns 
saying that they're the self or saying that they're in charge. So you just pick one. The fact that you feel neutral, maybe you feel neutral right now, or somewhat pleasant or somewhat unpleasant. So you just pick one, all right, feeling. Does feeling stand alone? Is it inherent? Is it unrelated to what came before it? Is it unrelated to perception? Is it unrelated to what you came into contact with? No. So it's not inherently existent, but it still exists, right? So then you think, okay, I am my intentions. I'm my intentions, whether they're verbally expressed or non-verbally expressed, whether they're conscious or subconscious, intentions feel like the self. The decision to move towards or away from this or that idea or this or that stimuli, that movement of mind feels like the driver, feels like the boss, feels like the self. And then you step away from it and you ask, what is intention based on? Did it, is it self-creating, self-perpetuating? No. Right, many influences, etc. right? So you can do that with any of the mental factors and that's coarse, right? Still, <laughs> it, but it's more subtle than we were. And even more subtle is the main mind or the primary consciousness, which is as if a container and the mental factors are like the contents but it's not, you know, that's kind of the impression we can have in the beginning. It's the container, or it's the umbrella, or it's the sky, and the thoughts are the clouds, right? So you kind of turn back and look at the projector, that which is bare awareness that just reflects. So if you look at the part of the mind that usually we don't have much experience of unless we're very quiet. You know, if our mind has become a, a bit more quiet and we have a little bit more objectivity with our thoughts and emotions and we see what's behind them or under them or above them, different to them, what is the part of our, ex our consciousness experience that is just reflecting without opinions? Yeah. And, you know, we try and touch that in clarity of mind meditation and touching that place gives us peace, a natural peace. That's kind of us in our natural state. And that is still not the self. <laughs> and that is still not inherently existent. But it's useful to touch. And you need to be able to experience that subtler level of your mental experience in order to see that it's empty. So touching the clarity of the mind helps on the relative side, on the method side, in order to bring you peace of mind, spaciousness, clarity, focus, very useful. On the wisdom side, you take that as your focal object. And you know, focal object is a weird word. It's not like you see it with your eyes, but your meditation object, you take that and you see how it is also empty of inherent existence. Yeah, because it depends upon what? Depends upon causes and conditions, meaning the previous moment of mind. Yeah, it relies upon parts. Yeah, sequentially or, you know, however you want to describe it, context. There's only main mind in context or contrast to mental factors even though they exist in the same place at the same time, looking at the same things, they are kind of, you know, conceptually distinct aspects of your mental experience. So context. And then deepest mind is merely labeled by the mind. Or primary consciousness is merely labeled by the mind. So the very thing that labels turns back and labels, kind of turns back on itself and labels. So, you know, if, if nothing else, at the end of this semester, I want you to really clearly understand that to be empty of an inherent existence doesn't mean non-existent. Yeah, it means it exists in a very specific way, a very particular way that is the opposite of how it appears. And if we keep being in denial about that, we will continue to suffer and hurt ourselves and others. 
you know? And so again and again, we'll say this in a million different ways, but it is that conceptual reinforcement of this premise, which helps you break through the illusion in daily life. You say it exists that way, that's the opposite of how it exists. They seem difficult, not from their own side. Again and again, they seem difficult, not from their own side. <laughs> These behaviors seem difficult. They're not difficult from their own side. I feel harmed and threatened, but I'm not inherently. And you keep cycling through the levels of dependency to prove emptiness to yourself. And you use the three spheres of emptiness, agent, action, object, and look at how each one of those three are dependent. Coming back to the root of samsara, then maybe just to make sure it's clear. So first link, ignorance in the 12 links of inherent existence is the view of a personal identity. Yeah, so first link, ignorance is a view, the view of the transitory collection or the view of a personal identity or the reifying view of the perishing aggregates, many synonyms. It is an innate self-grasping that has been present since beginningless time and gives rise to formative karma that projects rebirth in samsara. So it's not the acquired self-grasping that is due to familiarity with incorrect philosophies, nor is it the general mental factor of ignorance. It's much broader and includes ignorance. That one is much broader and includes ignorance regarding karma and its effects. Okay, so ignorance grasps the inherent existence of persons and phenomena, whereas the view of a personal identity grasps the inherent existence of only our own I and mine. So just be with that distinction. There's, there's ignorance in general, but this view only focuses on I and mine. So as Rinpoche says, the root of samsara is the thought that believes this truly existent I that appears to me is true. Okay, so I guess it's, it's just very important that we understand the root of samsara being specific to the self, but then because of that, everything else also appears inherently existent. But before we had grasping at the self, even though beginningless time, beginningless ignorance, there was also grasping at phenomena is inherently existent. But the problem is the view on the self from the Prasangika view. So the other schools will posit different levels and versions of this, but we boil down to the problematic thing is the way we see the self. Yeah. Does, does that ring true for you in terms of experience? Or do you feel like the main problem in people's lives is how they view things and other people? Or would you agree that the main issue, the core or the root of the problem in people's lives is a misunderstanding of themselves in relation to others? Because on the surface, sometimes it can look at look like they have a problem with how they view work or how they view money or how they view relationships or how they view people or what has happened to them, right? That, that, that would be a normal way of framing the suffering that people experience. That would be a normal way of framing your own suffering. But if, can you kind of pull it back into, if they didn't misunderstand their identity there would be less confusion, there would be less problematic behavior. It's an interesting framework because we usually talk about conditions when we talk about people's suffering and our own suffering. We talk about conditions and sometimes we talk about ignorance in terms of a misunderstanding of how other people are, right? Or a misunderstanding about how the world is or what priorities should be. But the main problem is the way we view our own specific self. It's viewing the I in our own mental continuum and holding that to exist inherently that starts off the whole pattern. 
And then I'm thinking about conditions that change the way we feel ourselves. As we work, the way we work, there are conditions that we try to change the way a person views himself or even deeper feels about himself self experience. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, is there a way in which you feel like your work also goes into the method side of the path and the wisdom side of the path in the way that Buddhism does? Like in the method side of the path, we're not looking at the inherently existent self appearing to us as the main problem. We're looking more at the afflictions and the suffering and how to manage those. And the root cause is something we know about, but we're not working on particularly with specific energy. You know, if you're angry, you're working on patience, you're working on love. You're working at understanding the impermanence of things. You're not looking at why. <laughs> you're looking at why in a surface way. I have a misunderstanding that's fueling my ignorance or that's fueling my anger, excuse me. Um, a lack of love, a lack of patience. Let me develop those skills and then I will protect my mind from anger. One side, the wisdom side is the whole reason I'm angry is because I think I am inherently being harmed and they are inherently a harmer and their actions are inherently harmful. You know, so we have that kind of twofold approach in Buddhism, the method side and the wisdom side, and eventually they come together. But in the beginning, they're two projects. Do you feel like kind of experientially with your patients that you kind of will go back and forth between let's work on surface issues, let's work on root causes, or do you feel like you stay more on one side or the other? <laughs> or it really depends on the patient? I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of things that you work on the surface side, it's all the time in the room. The deeper root side. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you can't be connected. It brings being empathic to a patient, brings him to start slowly to understand that his mother was not to blame, or that she had an issue that caused her to not be able to take him what he needed. Yeah, and kind of organically. If someone is really engaged with the process, they would come to the root being a misunderstanding of the way they exist in relation to others and the world. And if they were to kind of develop some flexibility there, their quality of life would improve and their compassion would increase. And that happens kind of organically as opposed to something that you try to orchestrate or manipulate or guide to happen. You kind of more allow it to happen within the space of empathy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> On a good day. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it helps to have a background framework that that's kind of an agenda, but not making it an agenda? It's like a really background agenda worldview that you're holding, but in no way saying or forcing or orchestrating. But do you think that maybe holding it gives more potential to the moment for that to come about? Or it doesn't matter. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. We have to work on grasping our eyes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. If we're there for the patient, it's easier to be in that state of mind, in that place. Um, but uh, all the time, to be more and more empathic and more and more to the pain with the patient. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm sure that like whenever you're feeling resistance to being with a certain patient or resistance to being with a certain aspect of what they're expressing or not expressing, whenever you're feeling kind of a, a kind of a pulling away or when you're feeling a kind of leaning towards with too much kind of, I don't know, aggressiveness or something, um, that, then to kind of take a minute and ask yourself, where is the grasping at inherent existence? You know, that can be, I think, maybe quite useful. 
Yeah. And then you open the space back up to kind of allow for the process to unfold. But as soon as you solidify and become concrete about your experience being true, then you kind of block certain possibilities. But if you were to deny what you're experiencing, that would be a problem too. You know, if you were to say, I'm not feeling this way, I'm not having this reaction, or I shouldn't, or I can't, that becomes its own issue too, obviously. And that's what we would call in Buddhism, spiritual bypassing, you know, knowing where you want to be. So jumping over where you are. Yeah. And that becomes, you know, huge obstacle for progress on the spiritual path, but I'm guessing it's also a huge obstacle in psychoanalysis. If you know how you want to respond to a patient, but you're not responding that way, but you're sort of forcing yourself to believe that you're responding the correct way without acknowledging where you are actually at issues yeah yeah absolutely that's so good. you know yeah sorry go ahead i i i'm just a second i introspection oh yeah i guess tries to do the method as in the wisdom not in in teaching to use this antidote for anger, but doing it by ourselves mm -hmm. is our patience uh, when we see anger, right? We won't yeah. teach him to use this antidote. And from the wisdom, wisdom side, I guess I won't uh, tell him what he sees is wrong, but I'll start in open, like, look inside like as you said as the viewer i'll start try to be the viewer with him mm. all kinds of points of view and start to feel for him uh, other sides of point of view so for that i has, have to be experienced on myself right and yeah. i guess you can do it by teaching, uh, studying it by yourself and meditating on this, uh, which is very, very similar to what I did years on the tell, by the way. Very, very yeah. similar. But if you don't experience by yourself or experience by the carrier's introspection, with mm. analysis, um, my therapist, right? And that helped me. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if you were to just realize emptiness, compassion would come very naturally, but not necessarily res taking responsibility or great compassion or bodhicitta. So if you realized emptiness, it wouldn't make sense to hurt anyone. It would make sense to try and alleviate suffering and when it was right in your face but you wouldn't necessarily have the drive, may I fully develop all of the possible qualities of a mind so I can be of greatest benefit to all sentient beings. And the reason to expand my mind completely is for their sake. Because if it's only for my sake, I could just realize emptiness and suffer almost not at all, progress to nirvana and stop there. And then I'm not hurting anyone. And then I'm not hurting myself and I'm not suffering. So it's like, we, we need this real battery charge of bodhicitta to make emptiness and method, both processes that we're working on simultaneously or alternating, but as our two main projects. Because with just emptiness, we end our own suffering and end our own harmfulness, but we're not expanding to how can I be of greatest benefit to all. So you just keep coming back, method, wisdom, method method wisdom and um, eventually they come together so anyway the, the main thing to think about today was just what is ignorance exactly <laughs> and what particular ignorance is the problem in our life and in the lives of others and what is the relationship between appearance and reality and to start kind of unpacking that so um so have a sit with it and um we'll dedicate may all beings everywhere plagued by sufferings of body and mind, 
find an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing and the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the misery of the world. Oh, thanks, guys. Nice to see you all together. <laughs> Do good bonding. <laughs> see you later today. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.